What's that? I'm, we're going live, friends, not just on this platform, but we just went live on YouTube. So, woohoo. We are now streaming live on YouTube. Admit. Admit. Yeah, All right. What? Hi, hi, Jack. Hi, fine. Thank you. How are you? Friends, not just on hi, this. Hi, Gary. Live on YouTube. <laughs> Maybe Gary cannot hear me, yeah? I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, finally we 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 oh, face to face, you know, each other we meet each other face to face. <laughs> yeah, for the first yeah, we've been chatting for a while, but this is the first time we've actually seen each other, I guess. Yeah, that's that's right, that's right, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, nice to nice to meet you here. It's a pleasure. Well, welcome, everybody. It's three o'clock, and I'd like to welcome you to another live stamp chat with the American Philatelic Society. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's great to see familiar faces and some new faces also. I'd also like to thank our APS members. It's your membership that makes these stamp chats possible, so thank you very much. We have been fielding some questions and inquiries about how can we you know, you guys have been really great with, with the stamp chats and the, the content. How, how can we help? Well, we've launched a, a program called APS Cares. So I would direct you to stamps.org where you can learn more about how you can help keep these great state stamp chats going and uh, help continue to, to deliver this great content. It, it's, it's from your generosity and we really do thank you. Without further ado, friends, I'd like to introduce Mr. Gary Lowe, our Director of Expertising here at the American Philatelic Society. He will be our presenter today, and I'm sure that's you all know that. That's why you're here en masse. And um, he is, will be talking with us about more adventures in expertising. So, Mr. Lowe, take it away. Thank you, Heidi. I think I'll leave it here rather than take it away, but... Um... Last time I gave you an introduction to uh, some of the adventures we have in expertising. And I, I thought today we'd do something a little bit different and go over some of the more recent case histories that we've had um, that fall into two categories, discoveries and uncoveries. Discovery is when we come up with something that um, hasn't been seen and hasn't been um, cataloged before, whether it's the Scott catalog or any of the other international catalogs, um, the standard of whether a, a stamp is something new is whether it's in the catalog. Uh, a, an uncovery, uh, on the other hand, is where the stamp or the cover may be uh, pretty rare, but we've uncovered another one. So instead of there being one known, there may now be two or more, but it's still a pretty rare stamp. Um, so today what we're going to be exploring is a few examples of that, including something that just happened this weekend, a Russian inverted Jenny. Bet you never heard of one of those before. Um, I'll show you a, uh, a vertical pair of Washington and Franklin from the Washington and Franklin series and uh, show how we determined whether or not this puppy was worth 10 grand. Um, I'll show you an example of a US die, -cutted, die cut omitted discovery. And then we'll go on and show a, uh, a direct result of that submission which was a die cut omitted uncovery, one that had been seen before, but this one was a bit different. And finally, um, no, we're, we're not gonna break our social distancing and go visit a McDonald's, but I'm gonna show you uh, more grills than uh, at a McDonald's hamburger joint. Um, no matter how often I talk about the Jennies, they keep on reappearing. So um, in my previous expertizing stamp chat, I showed you three examples of inverted jennies that had showed up on my radar 
actually in not only in four months, but in the first four months I'd been on board as director of expertising. Um, Gary, it, can you make sure, excuse me, that you're, the screen, it, there's words that are being cut off. Oh. Um, Perfect hmm. here. Perfect. Other where? Other. Give me a thumbs up if, if you guys see that it's perfect, please. Okay, then it's just me, as per usual, Gary. Well, it's actually me too, but since I know what's on the slides, I can deal with it. Yeah, I've got this vertical strip along the right side that shows everybody's uh, smiling faces. Uh, and I'd rather see that than the extra words. So um, as long as everybody else is seeing it fine, we can, we can go ahead. Well, I see Ms. Teresa, she too is cut off. I'm cut off at the bottom myself, but I could read about half the words at the very bottom. Just keep talking. Yeah, I think we're, I'll, I'll cope. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. All right. So anyway, um, even though I've been talking about Jenny's seemingly perpetually since I came on board, uh, they just keep on showing up and another one showed up um, on, uh, on Sunday, yesterday. And uh, this one was sent to me by uh, a gentleman in Russia. And this is what he sent. And you can see that this is clearly an inverted Jenny but it's canceled, uh, to the best of my knowledge, of the 100 known Jennies, none of them ever got used, which makes sense if you remember the history of the Jennies from the last time uh, we were chatting. But uh, it was a sheet of 100 that were uncovered, and they got into philatelic hands. They started off in philatelic hands. It was a philatelist that discovered that sheet. But when the sheet got broken up, they all went to philatelists, so nobody was going to take an incredibly um, rare stamp like that and go and use it for postage. So uh, this example is already immediately suspect. Um, but here you can see a better shot of it. It's um, got a Cleveland cancellation on it and some other red markings. But it really is, I mean, it does look like a Jenny. Um, and here you can see the back of it as well. So the cancellation ink bled through, as well as some of the ink apparently having bled through from the front of the original printing. It did not look like uh, to me that, that this was a set off, that this was uh, an image from, um, the sheet underneath when, when a stamp is wet, this looks like it's just bled through from the original printing. Um, I want to compare this stamp with a known forgery of the Jenny. Now here you can see that the colors are dramatically different. Uh, but that could just be variations in the scanning from the different sources that these scans may have come from. But, you know, on close inspection, they really do look very similar. And um, there's a reason for that. This is a Peter Winter forgery. Peter Winter was a forger who was uh, active in the uh, 1980s. Um, the example of this Jenner, Jenny forgery that I'm showing you here, inverted Jenny forgery, is from uh, Leonard Hartman's collection. Now, some of you may know um, Leonard Hartman as a dealer in rare books and philatelic books. He's also um, an expert and a collector in um, uh, CSA, Confederate States of America. And um, he also does work with stampless covers. So, and, and Leonard is, is on our expert committee in those last two areas. But I wasn't aware until recently that uh, Leonard had a very interesting collection 
of uh, forgeries. And uh, this is one from Leonard's collection. This example is a Peter Winter forgery. Peter Winter um, forged stamps from the United States, Switzerland, Austria, Romania, Spain, and um, probably another 10 or 15 other countries as well. Um, one of the keys to detecting a uh, Peter Winter forgery is that he used contemporary paper. He didn't try to fake the paper. And um, you know, there's some question in my mind whether in fact he was uh, seeking to fool collectors or just make some, some interesting space fillers, which is really the history of much of the classic forgers. Those forgers um, uh, like Sparati, for example, who were active in the 1870s and forward, weren't really looking to cheat collectors. They weren't looking to steal from philatelists. They were building um, space fillers for collectors who could not afford the genuinely rare articles. And those classic forgers are, um, are collectible in their own right. I saw an example of uh, listing on a website of an auction house just this past week where they are selling, uh, they're auctioning off uh, Sparatis and they're going for about $200 a piece. I don't know that Peter Winter forgeries are uh, all that expensive, but they're highly collectible. They are of great interest. And in fact, um, here's a, uh, um, a listing uh, or a, rather a website citation that contains a, a partial listing of the uh, Peter Winter forgery. So if you're interested in there, um, you, can, you can hang over to this website and um, um, have a look-see. It's a fairly old website. The software is a little bit dated, but it's a good starting point if the forgeries of Peter Winter are of interest to you. So let's move on to um, Washington Franklin's. Now, these are incredibly popular stamps from a collecting standpoint. And I would guess that of the US stamps that are submitted for expertizing to us, and in fact, to probably the other organizations as well, perhaps a third of them are Washington Franklin's. That's for two reasons. Number one, yes, they are very popular, but also they're incredibly difficult to authenticate. There are so many fakes and forgeries out there, fakes for the most part, that um, if you're thinking about buying one of the more expensive, say $200 or above for a Washington Franklin, you really want to be sure you're getting uh, what you think you're buying and what you're going to be paying for. And in the case of this particular vertical strip of two, that's got a $10,000 catalog value. So the owner of this stamp sent it into us um, for, for expertizing, for authentication. And it came in, he claims it's a 554B. Now the 554 is a normal perforated sheet, perforated panes, uh, perforated both horizontally and vertically. The B variety, 554B, has the horizontal perforations omitted. I don't know how many sheets of those are out there, but with a uh, $10,000 catalog value for an imperf pair, uh, there can't be all that many wandering loose. The description of the 554B is that it's unwatermarked. It is perforated 11 vertically. It's imperforate horizontally. Um, it is a flat plate printed issue, the two cent Carmen, and its design is A157. Those of you that are familiar with the um, 
with the Scott catalog know that at the very front, one of the earliest chapters is an identifier chapter for uh, all of the US issues. This is in the Scott Specialized. And it just lists a pretty picture of each of the unique stamps. And below each picture, it lists the different stamp catalog numbers that conform to that issue. So a 554, a 554B, and um, a whole bunch of other stamps that look identical have that uh, two cent Carmen, well, two cent design color could vary, but the two cent design identified in the identifier as A157. And this baby, if it's real, has catalog value of $10,000. Um, one of the other um, stamps with this same um, illustration, the A157, is a Scott number 577. Now that's a completely um, imperforate sheet. The stamps are all imperforate. And if you want to fake a 554B, you add perforations left and right. The reason you might be inclined to do that is the catalog value of a pair of, of the 577s is a big six bucks. That's rather different from um, $10,000. So what we did is in sequence, we sent this pair of stamps to three different members of our expert committee. And uh, I can tell you that what I'm reporting here today has uh, represents work that's just been completed this past weekend. Even though the APS has um, uh, ceased operations externally, the building is closed, lots of operations continue to go on. And that includes especially the members of the expert committee. They don't show up at uh, the American Philatelic Center all that often, but just because we're shut down, they are not. In fact, I made the observation earlier this morning that they seem to have more time on their hands now that they're all um, shut at home. And they've been, they've been diving in much deeper in some areas of expertizing than they, they normally do. So three members of the expert committee continued to work on this even as recently as this weekend. Um, expert two didn't happen to have a copy of this stamp in his own, or you'd have to have a pair of this stamp in his own reference collection. But he used the uh, Cusalis gauge to measure the perforations. Now, in contrast to a standard stamp gauge, um, the Cusalis gauge is designed specifically for United States stamps. So that if you look at a perf 11 on a standard gauge, you've got one set of those little perforation imitation designs that says perf 11. The Cusalis gauge, on the other hand, has four or five different shaped um, gauges for perf 11. So there, and for perf 12 and perf 10 as well, and goes up, I think, to even perf 13, I don't recall. But the Cusalis gauge is the gauge you need if you're gonna be uh, checking the perfs on your US stamps. Expert two, um, who's one of the best experts we have, I can tell you, but as with, with all of us, um, his reference collection is not complete. We've got 1400 volumes of stamps at the APS reference collection, and it's far from complete. So uh, even the experts, don't have complete reference collections, but it's critical, it really is critical um, to the expertizing process. So this particular expert, world renowned as he is, didn't have this particular stamp, but based on the Cusalis gauge, um, he, didn't like, he didn't like the fit uh, comparing this stamp, which he, the, this pair of stamps, which he physically had when he was examining it, but um, especially here, he said, 
I'm not really happy with that. Just doesn't look right to me. Too many variations. Um, he didn't think it was good. Um, our two other experts, however, thought the perfs were okay. And here's why. This is an example of overlaying two stamp images, making one of them transparent. Let me read to you uh, the description that expert three provided along with this. And I beg your indulgence for reading it, but it gets, it gets into the weeds here. Two images are made by overlaying an image of the suspect's left and right perforation. That's the stamp that was submitted uh, is a suspect uh, or a patient more commonly, but uh, on top of the 554 reference block. So um, our expert has a, a plate block of six of the 554. That's the one that's fully perforated, left, right, top and bottom. And uh, he overlaid the image of this stamp uh, on top of uh, his, his uh, expertizing block. So the image, uh, of the suspect is made transparent, then you line up the top perf hole, and if you see, and you check to see if the perfs continue to line up as you go all the way down the stamp to the very bottom. Um, let me give you a, an alternative view of what he was doing. Here you can see his reference plate block in the center, and he took the scan of the uh, patient stamp, his suspect, and lined it up on the left side and then lined it up on the right side. And you can see for yourself that that lineup is pretty darn good. Now, under the best of circumstances, under the most controlled of circumstances, with uh, the printing and perforating process going on at pretty high speed, it's impossible for perforations to be perfectly lined up and identical all the time. So you're gonna see variations. You have, as an expert, you have to be able to recognize where a variation is within, uh, let's call it normal tolerances, and when it is sufficiently suspicious that you've got a real problem. Experts one and experts three use it. Well, expert three created this, then we passed it back to experts one and two. And I can tell you that the consensus among the three became that um, good news for our member. This is indeed a 554B. It's a legitimate um, imperf between vertical pair of a Washington Franklin two cent. And um, don't tell anybody, please. I haven't informed the owner of this yet, but uh, he's gonna get a very nice, uh, not surprise because he submitted it as a 554, but he's gonna get a very pleasant confirmation that what he uh, suspected and hoped is indeed um, the case. So we're giving him a good cert on this one. but. Um, think about all the work that went into this, not just studying the stamp design and making sure that there isn't counterfeit going on, but the verification of um, the perforations uh, using techniques like this. What's really interesting is that between the three experts, I've got, I think, six pages of documents explaining how they did, what they did, and why they concluded what they concluded. Now, again, we had to go through, because I didn't have unanimity to begin with, we had to go through a, uh, an iterative process of sharing of this information. And it is that um, collaboration that I think is such an important aspect of how we at the American Philatelic Society go about our process of expertizing. Not only do we have uh, such a large group of experts, 
but they collaborate. And sometimes when they don't agree, there's some uh, email based hooting and hollering that goes on. But in fact, um, it's an annealing process. We, we harden our results by making sure that whenever possible, these folks are all really honestly in agreement. And when it comes to something like confirming a $10,000 uh, catalog value uh, pair of stamps, we need to be especially cautious. We're always cautious, but um, think about it this way. American Philatelic Society is the only expertizing organization that has a guarantee on each certificate it issues. If we make a mistake, we put our money where our opinion is and we guarantee uh, the results of our work. So that's why we go through uh, as, as much of this kind of a process as, as we do. Uh, let me change the subject and show you this article that appeared in Linz in the September 9th, 2019 issue. It was, and this is just a clip of the top of, of the first page of that article, uh, about a discovery of a die cut omitted stamp, or um, I should say pane, that's a full pane of uh, 20 stamps that um, was purchased at a Navy base at the US Post Office at a Navy base in Rota in Spain. And turns out that it's, um, it's a die cut omitted, or at least it's a partial die cut omitted uh, stamp. Well, I had an email from a member who said, I read that Lynn's article and I've got a pane of stamps that seems to have the same condition. And I told him he should send in for expertizing this pane of George W. Bush uh, commemorative stamps. This was issued back in June, briefly after that Missouri issue came out, if I recall correctly. But um, this pane, I got an inquiry. I said, looks like it's worth getting an opinion. Send it in. And let's have a closer look. There we go. And here you can see, I mean, it's always hard to tell the absence of something, but if you look carefully, you're not going to find any evidence of that serpentine die cut that characterizes uh, stamps normally issued uh, today. These, uh, these pre-gummed self-adhesive stamps that are issued are separated for the most part by serpentine die cuts. Um, so what do we have to do to authenticate something like this? Well, first thing we need to do is make sure that there's no evidence of a die cut, even a blind die, die cut anywhere at all on the pane. Now a blind cut is where the paper is not completely punched through, but there's slight evidence if you look under magnification that the die cutting mat, and that's what's used to create these die cuts, is a sharp razor edged mat. Think of it like a, um, like a fancy cookie cutter, serpentine cookie cutter, that comes down and is pressed into uh, the paper. Now, all of these stamps have two layers. They've got the paper on which the stamp is printed, and then they have the backing layer, which has got some wax paper on the inside so that you can peel the stamp off more easily. And um, when the stamp is being, when the sheets are being die cut, it is sometimes the case for whatever mechanical reason that the die cut mat comes down, kisses the surface of the stamp, but doesn't perforate that top layer of paper. If there's any evidence at all that that kiss took place, then it's called a blind 
die cut, which is very much like a blind perforation when you're talking about perforated stamps. Um, if you can see any, any little scratch on the surface, any serpentine shaped evidence, then that's a blind die cut. And um, it may be a curiosity, but it is not an error. Um, also important, there should be no evidence of a die cut on the reverse of the pain. Consider the possibility of somehow a sheet of stamps is flipped over inside a stack of stamps that are being processed through this um, die cutting process. Now, if you look at it from the front, there's absolutely no evidence, not even a blind perf. But if you look at it at the back, you can see that inadvertently the stamp had been flipped over and those die cut serpentines are now on the back instead of the front. That also is uh, a philatelic freak or oddity. It is not an error. It will not get into the Scott catalog. Um, but there's a third condition besides the absolute absence of any evidence of die cutting on either side. And that's, this is not printer's waste. Well, what's printer's waste? In the printing process where millions and millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of stamps are being created, the printing presses are mechanical devices and mistakes are made. The human operators are not infallible. Mistakes are made. Part of the printing process is quality control. So what you get is human inspection about all of the uh, over all of the sheets that are going through a printing press, there is a surprising amount of waste that gets pulled out from the printing process, dumped into um, big troughs on wheels, and supposedly is shredded and destroyed. Sometimes a postal employee, and this that's happened more than once. It happens pretty frequently because we've got a standard name for the process of, of why we have printer's waste. A less than ethical postal or a printing employee will grab a hold of some of these uh, mistakes and sell them on the outside. There have been any number of cases where um, stamps have been submitted I don't know to us, but elsewhere, where it was determined that the stamps were printer's waste, they were stolen from the uh, printing plants. And in one case that I, I know of, at least one case, the uh, postal inspection authorities did an investigation, identified who stole those stamps, and one of the two perpetrators is serving time or did serve time in prison. So printer's waste is a really big concern. The question is, is this pain of stamps printer's waste or uh, legitimately issued to a post office for sale? Now, how do you determine that? Because let's, let's be realistic. The difference between printer's waste and an official in the catalog error is whether it was sold legitimately or not. It's the same darn piece of stamp, whether it, whether it left the printing plant legitimately or illegitimately. So in this case, I had to work with the two members of our expert committee to identify how these stamps were purchased and got documentation from the owner, the person that submitted them to us, that the stamps had in fact been purchased. Um, you know, we're not, we're not sleuths, we're not Perry Mason, we're not able to verify stories by going out and investigating, but to the best of our reasonable ability, we checked out the story, we had evidence that these were legitimate purchased at a post office um, stamps, and therefore, 
with the opinions of two members of our expert committee, we were able to um, we were able to give this the okay, and very importantly, we reported this to the Scott Catalog people. We have to work very closely with them. Um, it is important that as these discoveries are made, Scott Catalog be informed. So. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple uh, questions in the chat. One is, can we see the reverse side? Um, can you see the reverse side? No, because I don't have a scan handy. Um, but yes, we have scans of it, and it's a blank sheet of paper. Second, does that evidence for proof of purchase at a post office? Is it a receipt? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, the important thing here is that if we don't tell Scott about it, two things happen or two things don't happen. One, Scott never finds out about it. And two, the variety doesn't get a sub catalog number. So the important part here um, is we communicate to Scott and they get back to us and say, okay, instead of it being a, uh, uh, I forget what the catalog number on this is actually, but instead of it being just a number with a uh, with the word VAR for variety after it, it in fact gets a letter A or B or whatever appended to it. So um, our commitment when we make discoveries, when we confirm discoveries like this, is that we'll report it to Scott Scott tells us the correct catalog number. When we issue the cert, we don't know what that new catalog number is, and Scott can take any number of months before they uh, make a final determination based on our opinion and whatever other evidence they might want. So um, we issue the certificate and it says catalog number VAR, as in variety. Our commitment to uh, the owner of that stamp is that when we get the corrected catalog number, the actually new issue for the variety, we will issue a new cert to that same owner. Um, we are still waiting to hear back from Scott on this. But let me go back uh, to this article uh, because when we wrote up that Bush die cut omitted stamp and did a little blurb on, our, uh, on, on the stamps.org website, Somebody else reached out to me and said, you know that article uh, that was in Linz that you spoke about when you confirmed the Bush pain? I think I have a pain of the Missouri stamps. All right, so two things happened. Linz came out with the article on the Missouri that motivated a member to send us the, uh, the Bush die cut. And then following that, um, perhaps another one of these die cut omitted uh, Missouri's showed up. But here's the, here's the key down at the bottom right corner there. You can see it said, um, this pane which Lynn's examined, the top three rows have no die cuts, but there are die cuts on the bottom two rows. So this is only a partially die cut sheet. I haven't yet figured out uh, how in the production process that would take place. But, um, you know, this is what, this is what came in uh, to us. And as was the case with the Bush stamp, um, again, there's no evidence on either side that there, uh, there was a die cut, not even a, a kiss kind of die cut. You know, the, uh, the faint evidence, there's no evidence of that at all. What's really very interesting to me though, is that um, this pain is from exactly the same position as the, uh, the Rota Spain, uh, Spain example, but this one was bought in Texas. Now let me explain what I mean. These panes of stamps, these panes of 20, are printed on full sheets of six panes. 
um, I'm sorry, full sheets of nine panes, three by three. These examples are from position six on the full sheet. That's the second row, the right-hand side. Now that's position six, one, two, three across the top, four, five, six across the middle, all right? We don't know what the distribution is between uh, US military bases and post offices in Texas, but it just struck us as a very interesting coincidence that, um, that it's from the same uh, pain position on the sheet. My guess is that, um, we now have two examples from the same pain position. So there are at least two sheets with pains that are die cut omitted. I would speculate that the entire sheet of nine pains is uh, die cut omitted. It just, the entire sheet didn't get, um, get processed during the die cutting uh, phase. So there, I'm guessing there are a total of at least 18 panes out there, nine for each sheet. The odds of one pane only being a die cut omitted seem lower to me than would be, uh, yeah, would be probable. So I'm guessing there's more to be discovered out there but here again, this is an opportunity for us to report back to the nice folks at the Scott catalog and let them know that a full pane of these stamps, completely full die cut omitted has been discovered. Um, finally, let me uh, talk about my little McDonald's uh, joint example. Here's a uh, US Scott we believed to be, or the owner believed to be, a uh, Scott 100. And there you can see on the back grills eh, all over the place. Here's the basic grill appearing on the back of the stamp. And we determined that. Um, it was a Scott number 100, a double F grill. That was split um, in four different corners. So what happened here is two things. It went through the grilling process, meaning that a mat came very much like die cutting, right? A mat came down and impressed that center grill onto the stamp, onto a sheet of stamps. But then in a second pass, which should not have taken place, so it's a double grill, the stamp did in fact get grilled. But in addition to that second uh, grilling, if you will, the sheet of stamps had to be offset either left or right. So there was a horizontal offset as well as a vertical offset. So you are seeing in these four corners, grills that should have been on four different stamps showing up on this one stamp. It is pretty common to see double grills where the stamp goes through twice, but perfectly aligned. Um, it is equally, uh, well, I don't know, equally, but it is not, it is also common, relatively speaking, to see a uh, split grill where if it was shifted vertically, you'll get part of the second impression on the top part on the bottom, it'd be blank in between. If you get a left to right, a horizontal shift, you'll see a complete, uh, half of a complete grill on the right, another half on the left. But this is a quad split. There are other stamps that are known 
um, with this condition, but this is a discovery copy of a US Scott 100 with a double grill that is quad split. Now on top of it, we confirmed, we confirmed that this had a um, pretty uncommon Hiago uh, Japan cancel on the front and those make it even more highly collectible. We don't do valuations. I don't guess on catalog values, but comparable stamps from other issues have been seen to sell at auction for in excess of $1,000. So while this is a fairly common F grill uh, in normal state, this one could go for a grand at auction. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I thank you very much. Heidi? Yeah, I'm unmuting myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Uh, I guess I lost my start. Okay. Nice presentation, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. That's sure. from Don Hedger in West Toronto Stamp Club, Toronto. Very, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I made a comment. I will jump in. I don't know how the post office uh, uh, sends their DEXA stamps out to APOs across the world, but I rather doubt they send them out the same way as they do to post offices. Here in Louisville, Texas, is the Army Air Force Exchange Service, the Walmart of the military, excluding the Navy. The Navy has to do its own thing. I rather suspect that they uh, send it to Louisville and then it gets dispatched out to uh, the rest of the world through Military Airlift Command at MAC in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So that might exp explain the Texas connection there. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, it is... Um... It is known that, um, oh, there we go, okay. Hang on, okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's known that the, the military, uh, the army has its own distribution and they get one, um, one distribution directly from the post office that, that they determine how to split up. What I found interesting is in trying to track this information down, I learned that generally it is the case that the army gets distributions from later printings if, they're, if the printings aren't adequate. Um, we had a, a case recently where for another military distribution, um, the, um, the plate, number on the sheet was different than any that had been seen before. And the speculation is, and we haven't, we haven't resolved this yet, but speculation is that it was because it was done from a subsequent catch-up printing of that particular stamp issue. So um, I don't know if that's generally the case or was the case in, in, at, you know, just for this one stamp. But it's, it's something to consider when you're looking at varieties that are coming out of military bases. From Mr. Zom, how often do you see modified created grilled stamps? Modified as in fakes? Mr. Zom, if you wanna unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask Gary the question yourself if you'd like. Yeah, I meant that as fakes. Yeah. Oh, um, I guess the answer is way too often. Um, I said earlier that the Washington Franklins comprise about a third of the U.S. material that we get in. Maybe a little high, but it's certainly around 30%. Um, half of what we get in in Washington Franklins is misidentified. Of that half, so let's call that 15%, of that 15%, half is simply that 
Um, the submitter probably a new or intermediate collector. Just just misidentified the stamp. Either didn't know how to use the Scott catalog, which really gets into great depth, or you know just guessed wrong. But it's it's a uh, you know just a, a normal error of misidentification on the part of the owner. But the other half of that seven, eight, ten percent of what we get in is faked material. Perfs added, perfs cut off. You know, if the uh, stamp is more, and it's almost always the case, the stamp's more valuable either perfed or imperfed, depending on which particular stamp you're looking at. Uh, some faker is coming along and uh, <laughs> adding or removing perforations. It's much harder to fake, um, oh, for example, grills I was just talking about. Sometimes the stamps without the grills are the more valuable. We see endless examples of grills that have been pressed out. And it's only by very careful examination um, under great magnification and using angled lighting and a whole variety of other techniques that we're able to detect that grills were there and were pressed out. I've seen examples, not all that common, but in some cases, some, some forger decided it was worth the effort to either add or try and remove a watermark. You don't see much of that, but it's not unheard of. So um, the bad guys are out there looking to steal from philatelists and that's why, that's a big reason why the American Philatelic Society started its expertizing group in 1903. We've been at it for a while. We keep getting better and smarter, uh, but the bad guys are getting better and smarter too. And using technology, they are coming up with ingenious ways of faking stamps, taking real stamps and um, adding absolutely undetectable, undifferentiable, Overprints and surcharges. It's it's an area that is so rife with forgeries that if I had to cite a single reason why we issue a no opinion, where we can't decide that we can't determine that something is in fact genuine, it's in overprints and surcharges. It used to be pretty easy to detect because somebody would make a hand stamp up, a rubber hand stamp or a wooden hand stamp. Um, those are pretty easy to detect. Um, more modern fakers would simulate an overprint or a surcharge by running it through a uh, laser printer. But, and, and that too is pretty easy to detect under high magnification. But some of the fakes and forgeries that are out there today are just so good that, um, it's really hard and, and we're forced, unfortunately, to issue no opinion certs on a lot of that kind of material. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that the forgery that goes on in China, most of which is counterfeiting, intended to steal from the post office, not from collectors, but that same technology is used in China for modern Chinese material. And we've got a really strong bench when it comes to our uh, China expert committee. A lot of times they just refused to express an opinion because there's too many undetectable fakes out there. So yeah, there's a lot of it. Well, that's a, that's a really good uh, lead in to, we had a, a question, how many uh, expertizers do we have in APS? But then also how does the APS expertise this recent material that you're saying that's coming in from China? Hmm, okay. Um, I have been blessed, we have been blessed with um, about 180 members on our expert committee. We expertise the world with a few rather challenging exceptions. There are a couple of countries, no more than a couple, but there's a few countries where we just can't find qualified experts. Um, other than that though, we, uh, we do in fact cover the world pretty thoroughly. The only organization on the planet that does that um, and um, how do we expertise? Was that the second? It, it, with this new, with, oh, 
directly, Linz has reported a number of forgeries of recent U.S. definitives coming from China. How does the APS expertise this recent material? Okay, um, that's a really good question. And the, the answer has to do with big magnifying glasses. And um, you will look for microprint, which is a part of all of our definitive and many of our commemorative issues. The, up until recently, the, the counterfeiters coming out of China were not able to duplicate that microprint or if they had it on at all, it was a poor imitation because it is so small, so tiny um, that um, they were not able to, uh, to counterfeit the microprint embedded in those stamps. Another example is where um, stamps uh, are tagged so that they will fluoresce under UV lighting. And that's how the canceling machines detect that, that uh, counterfeits are going through, the lack of tagging. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially more recently, the tagging is there, but is not the same. It is differentiable from the genuine tagging. So there are ways even with contemporary um, forgers and, and counterfeiters at work to detect their efforts. Uh, we, um, back in the early fall, we were, uh, we were given a wonderful gift of VSC 6000, which is a scientific tool used um, for the detection of suspect documents. That's the purpose that it was built for. And I can't think of a category that is uh, of documents uh, that is larger than stamps when it comes to being suspect. So we've been using um, our VSC 6000 for the detection of fakes and forgeries. That's one of the many, many reasons uh, to use that wonderful piece of equipment. Sadly, the computer attached to it crashed recently and uh, got to go figure out how to pay for coming up with a, a new computer. I got a, I got a $2,000 problem on my hands here to um, replace that piece of equipment because the VSC 6000 has become central to uh, the work that the expert committee is now doing, not to replace them, but to supplement the work that we do. And I will tell you that once the expert committee learned that we had a VSC 6000 on board, not only did they get excited, but let me say that 10 or 15% of the really difficult patients that come in, the expert committee is telling us, have a look at it on the VSC 6000, to confirm what we think we know or, or tell us otherwise. So it's a really, piece, a really important piece of equipment that helps us keep ahead of the bad guys. Hey, Gary, this is Scott. I, I, you know, with 180 experts on the committee, it sounds like we've got a, more than enough, but I know and you know that that's not quite accurate. It's for the folks watching today and anybody who would be watching in the future, how does one become an expert for the expertizing committee? Ah, okay. That's, that's a great question. I will tell you that I am very actively and all the time recruiting new members for the expert committee. And if you are interested in becoming one, just drop me an email. I will send you a, um, a sheet that has a PDF that has a complete list of all the criteria we use in evaluating members of the expert committee. It starts with being a member of the APS. That's an absolute requirement because of the code of ethics involved. If you think code of ethics is important at the member level, even more important that uh, the members of our expert committee are held accountable to that uh, standard as well. But you need a reference library of uh, a reference collection of comparable stamps. You need years of experience. Um, you need a good philatelic library on your area of specialization. You need to be able to know how to uh, detect fakes and forgeries. All the subject matter that I was talking about today is a specialized area of expertise that each of the members of our expert committee has to have. Some of them uh, also have 
uh, very specialized areas of expertise that aren't a standard requirement uh, for being a member, but certainly supplements um, uh, their utility on the expert committee uh, group. So there are lots of criteria. Helps if you've been published on an area of expertise, and it's critically important that you have references. I am looking for members for the expert committee that have um, either both, either uh, very deep stamp collecting experience or about 20, 25% of the members of our expert committee are also dealers. Stamp collectors have one or two examples in their collection. A dealer might have seen a hundred or a thousand of a rarity over uh, a lifetime of dealing in stamps. So being a dealer is one of the criteria that uh, ups the probabilities that you've got the qualifications. Uh, there's no test involved. There's no certification of who's qualified to be an expert, but um, this, this document with the criteria in it um, really lays out the tools that, that we use to decide uh, who gains admission. But thank you for that question, Scott. Really, thank you. That was our, that was our director, Scott English. Uh, Gary, thanks so much for your adventures in expertising. Always a great show. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us. We have burned through another incredibly fascinating hour of stamp chat. Please join us tomorrow. Make sure that you know tomorrow is at 11 a.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, because we're gonna have our friend, Mr. Martin Dave, who's also Agave on the call. Um, he'll be coming for, to us from India. He is a fellow for the Royal Philatelic Society of London. He'll be speaking on the 1854 two on a stamp printed on one on a watermark. So do join us at 11 a.m. tomorrow, stamp chat, find the login at stamp.org. Uh, thanks again for your support, APS members. And if you're not a member yet, please consider doing so. Have a great day, stay safe, continue to collect. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much, Heidi. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. You got a lot of and great accolades in the chat, Gary. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Gary, thank you for Thanks. the information on the expertization committee. I will contact you and I will offer myself to help the American Philatelic Society on my specialities. So if I can uh, be of any help. Thank you. All right, Thanks. friends. Take Thanks. care, everyone. See you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you, Gary. Bye. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.